Hi, I'm Sherilyn Smith. I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor at the University of Washington. And in this video, we'll be talking about causes of viral meningitis and encephalitis. The organisms I will be talking about are spread by vectors and are important causes of encephalitis and meningitis worldwide. They have distinct risk factors, which highlight important questions for you to ask in your history. Here are the learning objectives. To outline the epidemiology, clinical manifestations, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of common causes of viral encephalitis and meningitis. We'll be talking about arboviruses using the example of West Nile virus and rabies virus. Here is your course map, which localizes West Nile virus. So the name arbovirus comes from combining arthropod, born, and virus into one word. This group of viruses are transmitted by insects, typically mosquitoes and ticks. As you can see in the chart, in the United States, there are several different viruses that cause disease and distinct viruses that cause disease internationally. All of them present similarly and all have uh, different vectors or mosquitoes or ticks that um, allow them to be spread. And we're gonna use West Nile as an example of how this occurs. <clears throat> Collectively, they are a common cause of encephalitis or inflammation of the brain parenchyma. So first I'd like to talk about an outbreak of West Nile virus or WNV and for this uh, presentation. So in August of 1999, an infectious disease physician in New York City uh, found that there were some patients with encephalitis and reported them to the Department of Health. On investigation, the Department of Health identified a cluster of six patients with encephalitis, five of them who had profound muscle weakness, and four of them required respiratory support. And this was very unusual. By the end of September of the same year, a total of 17 confirmed and 20 probable human cases, as well as four deaths, had been reported in New York City. The four deaths occurred in people who were older than 65. One patient had the onset of symptoms um, in late August and reported a history of travel to Africa where West Nile virus is endemic. No one else had traveled to an endemic area. This is when West Nile virus came to the United States and became a common cause of encephalitis and meningitis. So let's talk about the clinical pres presentation of West Nile virus. So the incubation period is two to 14 days from the time of inoculation to developing symptoms. However, like many viral infections, most West Nile virus infections are asymptomatic. About 20% of infected people developed West Nile fever. Um, this is characterized by fever, headache, myalgias, weakness. Some patients have abdominal pain, vomiting, nausea, and may develop a maculopapular rash. The fatigue and malaise that occurs with this can persist for weeks, but the other symptoms usually resolve in several days. About 1% of patients develop more severe disease or West Nile neuroinvasive disease, which is very similar to polio. These patients have headache, fever, stiff neck, encephalitis. They may have a movement disorder um, and an inability to control their limbs, seizures, acute or flaccid paralysis, again, with or without encephalitis. The flaccid paralysis occurs because there is damage to nerve cells within the, within the spinal cord and they may actually um, have symptoms that progress to respiratory paralysis requiring mechanical ventilation like the patients that were described in the initial outbreak. The poliomyelitis that can occur with West Nile virus often presents as isolated limb weakness or paralysis. Overall, there's a 2 to 10 percent mortality rate primarily in older patients. So let's talk about the virus itself. So West Nile virus is an RNA virus that's transmitted by mosquitoes, making it an arbovirus. It's part of the Flavi uh, virus family. And the picture here in this slide shows how the virus is transmitted. So there's amplification of the infection when mosquitoes bite birds who are already infected with West Nile, and then in turn, they bite another uninfected bird um, who develops uh, new infection. Many different birds can um, host the virus. Uh, these include crows, ravens, blackbirds, some types of hawks, and so um, birds are the definitive host. Occasionally, uh, infected mosquitoes will bite horses or people. Um, because people and horses all have much lower levels of viremia than birds do, there is not continued transmission of the virus in between um, people who are 
uh, subsequently bitten by um, a mosquito who might uh, bite somebody who, a patient who has um, West Nile virus. Thus, people are considered dead in hosts for the virus. So West Nile virus is very widespread. There is a worldwide distribution, and this uh, organism can be found in Africa, Europe, North America, much of Asia, and sporadically in South and Central America. Um, it was first detected in the United States in 1999 and is very well widespread now, that, so you can see in the figure. Um, the people who are at highest risk for developing disease after being infected are older patients and patients who are immunosuppressed. Okay? And even though there is not mosquito to person to mosquito to person transmission, rarely people can be um, infected via transfusion or organ transplant. So let's talk about how West Nile causes disease. So there is local replication in the dermis at the site of the viral inoculation, as well as viral replication at the draining lymph nodes. And both of these result in that more sustained viremia that can cause the rash and fever and myalgias. How the virus actually gets into the brain is an area of ongoing research. There are a few theories. Uh, first is there is disruption of the blood-brain barrier by inflammatory molecules like we see in other types of meningitis and encephalitis. Possibly the virus gets in via infected lymphocytes or macrophages, sort of like a Trojan horse. And finally, there may be retrograde infection of peripheral nerve cells and transport into the CNS like we see with enterovirus and polio. So if you have a patient who you suspect has West Nile, what do you do? Um, we really don't do a lot of uh, testing um, in patients um, who are not very sick. So we reserve this for um, people who have severe disease or immunocompromised patients. If someone has neurologic disease, a CSF examination generally shows elevated lymphocytes, but neutrophils may predominate early in the course of the illness. We also send specific tests for West Nile virus, and the IgM in the CSF is the most sensitive. You do have to um, rule out other arboviruses that are circulating that might give a false positive result for this test. The PCR in the CSF has less sensitivity, about 55%. Another way to make the diagnosis is to test the IgM levels in the blood. Um, this is a marker of acute infection. Alternatively, we can test the serum IgG when the patient first comes into the office um, and then again four to eight weeks later and compare the level of IgG in the serum. A fourfold increase between the first and second sample is diagnostic. A brain MRI is uh, frequently normal but may be somewhat helpful if the patient has focal neurologic symptoms. So what about treatment and preventing? prevention. So treatment is largely supportive. We want to make sure that there is adequate oral intake and pain and fever control. There are no um, antivirals for this infection. Overall, the prognosis is very good. Most people recover without problems. Advanced age is associated with more severe disease like the poliomyelitis or um, encephalitis. And um, people who do recover from West Nile virus um, may have uh, symptoms for uh, quite a long time, as I mentioned above. For those patients who have uh, recovered from the West Nile uh, virus encephalitis or poliomyelitis might be left with residual neurologic deficits. Finally, prevention really has to do with decreasing the exposure of a patient to mosquitoes. Personal protection and environmental, environmental control through um, insecticides are important. So what I'd like to do is talk now about rabies virus and start off with a true story. So an usher swatted the bat to the floor, Geesey picked it up by the tip of each wing, carried it outside to get rid of it, and as soon as she stepped through the door, the bat sunk a fang into her left forefinger and, she refu and it refused to let go. She flung it into the nearby tree and didn't think more about it. Within three weeks, she started getting sick, beginning with flu-like symptoms, fatigue, and tingling in her left arm. Then came the vomiting, the double vision, and the loss of coordination. This is the true story of the first person to survive after they became symptomatic with rabies in the world. Um, she survived with an experimental treatment, and five other people have survived symptomatic rabies since 2011. Previously, rabies was universally uh, fatal. So let's talk about the clinical presentation of rabies. Um, it really is characterized by progressive neurologic symptoms, so remember that. 
First, patients develop fever, headache, general, general weakness, or discomfort. Then, as the disease progresses, more specific symptoms occur and may include insomnia, anxiety, confusion, slight or partial paralysis, excitation, hallucinations, agitation, hypersalivation, difficulty swallowing, and fear of water come later. Death usually occurs within days of the onset of these latter symptoms. So rabies is an RNA virus in the Lyssa virus family. It's transmitted through the bite of a rabbit animal. Other ways to contract the illness are through contact with saliva by being licked by a rabbit animal or inhalation of viral particles. There may be minor or no trauma noticed at the time of inoculation, especially if the bat is the vector. Wild animals account for about 92% of reported cases in the United States in 2010. Raccoons are the most common, followed by skunks, bats, and foxes. You can see the distribution of the vectors on the slide here. Among domestic animals in the United States, cats are the most um, uh, frequent species reported. In contrast, worldwide exposure to rabid dogs is the big problem. They account for over 90% of human exposures to rabies and over 99% of human deaths due to this infection. So let's talk about how rabies causes disease. So rabies spreads through the nerves to the spinal cord and the brain. This is an example of direct neuroinvasion of an organism. The sequence of events that I'm gonna describe happens in all mammals affected with, uh, by rabies. So first there's contact with infectious saliva, usually through a bite. There's local replication um, at the site of the infection, and then retrograde spread from the peripheral nerves to the spinal cord and brain that takes somewhere between three and 12 weeks. Once the virus is in the brain, there is rapid replication and then spread out back out of the central nervous system via the nerves to salivary glands and other organs. There is then viral shedding in the saliva and symptoms. So if you suspect your patient has rabies, how do you make the diagnosis? Well, pre-mortem, uh, saliva can be tested uh, by viral isolation in culture or by RT-PCR. Serum and spinal fluid can be tested for antibodies to the rabies virus. A skin biopsy at the nape of the neck are examined for rabies antigens um, in the hair follicles uh, at the site of the biopsy. Um, Post-mortem, the diagnosis is made by histologic and immunohistochemistry examination of brain tissue. And you can see an example of this in the slide right here, where the arrow shows the rabies virus in a neuron. Finally, animals undergo um, uh, his, uh, histology and direct fluorescent antibody tests of their brains. So rabies in humans is 100% preventable through prompt, appropriate medical care. Yet more than 55,000 people, mostly in Africa and Asia, die from rabies every year at a rate of about one person every 10 minutes. Unbelievable. What I'd like to do now is walk through the treatment and prevention of this disease. So there's only experimental treatment with less than a 10% of survival if the patient is infected and becomes symptomatic. The goal, therefore, is to treat the patient before symptoms develop. Post-exposure prophylaxis is very effective if given earlier. Remember the timeline of how long it takes rabies to get to the brain. So, if the patient is bitten, there's a three-step process. First, clean the wound extremely well, inject rabies-specific antibodies into the wound to bind up the virus, and begin immunization series um, at day 0, 3, 7, and 14. Since the virus is in the nerve cell within 72 hours, it's really important to initiate treatment early. We also know that the same vaccine is effective in as a preventive therapy for people who may have high risk for exposure to rabies, say people who are vets or have lots of exposure to bats. Finally, prevention can occur through community control, such as immunizations of dogs and cats. So in summary, arboviruses and rabies are important causes of encephalitis and meningitis worldwide. To determine whether these viruses are causing neurologic symptoms in your patient, you need to ask about contact or bites from insects and animals. These organisms directly invade the brain and cause symptoms. And while there's no specific treatment for arboviruses, post-exposure prophylaxis, including rabies-specific immunoglobulin and vaccine, can prevent death if given in a timely manner.